Alright, so in the last video we introduced the Laplace transform and we talked about how it can be used to solve ordinary differential equations but before we can actually implement it we need to talk about the inverse Laplace transform. Now I'm just going to write it down here so that you can see what it looks like but it's generally a bit of a complicated concept because it needs some understanding of complex analysis which is essentially um, the analysis of functions of a complex variable. So if you don't have the background, it might be a little bit strange to see the following expression, but I will hopefully explain it clearly enough so that you don't really have to go through the pain of learning complex analysis before you can actually use it to invert the Laplace transform. So this is how we define it, uh, how we define the inverse Laplace transform. So it is a sum of residues, and a residue is essentially a function that is defined as follows. So in this case, we have e to the st f of s at some point sk. So sk is a fixed point, and it is equal to the following. So it's n minus 1 factorial of the limit uh, as s goes to s Okay, so this is a variable, this is a fixed point, times the derivative of oh, the nth minus 1 derivative, so ds n minus 1, and that's going to be acting on the following function, so that's going to be e to the st times f of s times s minus the fixed point sk, to the power of n and we're gonna put all that together like this so this looks like a very uh, intimidating formula but I'm gonna explain what each of these terms means so n is the order of the pole so order of pole and a pole in complex analysis is essentially Whenever you have a fraction in the or, or a fraction of function, you have some function that is something like a polynomial in the denominator. A pole is a point in which the denominator becomes zero. So to give you an example, let's say we have the fractional function s minus a squared and s plus b. So we're gonna have a pole for each of the roots of this polynomial or each of the values of s that will actually give us a zero in the denominator because that we know that when you divide something by zero you essentially get an undefined function and that uh, concept in complex analysis is we just call it a pole and the order of the pole is essentially the um, whatever number whatever power is attached to that number so in this case we have two poles we have one here where s is equal to a because if s is equal to a we have a minus a and that becomes the whole thing becomes zero and that becomes undefined and we have an so this would be order two because that is the simplest form in which we can express that because we know that this is the same as saying s minus a times s minus a and because it's the same pole we just call it a pole of uh, order two this one is a pole of order 1 because we notice that the power that is attached to it is just power of 1. And this one is going to be s equals to minus b, so n equals to 1. This pole is going to be s minus b. And these points here are what we choose as our fixed points, sk. So if we were given this function, f of s, what we would do is we would put it in here, multiply it by st, so that's what we, uh, we would get here. Our sk would be the fixed point, so let's say we take a, we would put a wherever sk is in the formula, and n would just go into wherever n is, so this would be 2 minus 1 factorial, this would be 2 minus 1, so that would become the first derivative of this function, and this n here would become two as well. So in the end we would have a function that hopefully simplifies a little bit before we need to differentiate. Once we differentiate we take the limit as s goes to the fixed point 
and then we multiply by this constant at the front and that will give us the value of the residue. Now obviously this applies for any number of residues that we have and we're going to have a residue for each distinct value of SK. In this case we would have two of them so we would have to calculate this for two different values. So we, we in the end we would have two residues and then our inverse Laplace transform would be the sum of those two residues together. So that's a bit of a, of a mouthful and it's a very um, complicated concept but I'm going to show you an example of how this works and hopefully that will give you some intuition as to how this is applied and how it can be used to find the inverse Laplace transform. So let's say that you're given the function of frequency f of s equals to 1 over s plus a. So a very simple function. Now the first thing we need to do obviously is find what the poles are in the function. So in this case we notice well the polynomial in the denominator is simply a function it's just order 1 because this is the same as saying this is to the power of 1. We cannot really simplify this further so the pole is of order 1 there's only one of them and the value is going to be s equals to minus a. So this is going to be our value of sk. So how are we going to find the residue? Well, there's only going to be one residue. The residue is going to be the following. So it's going to be with the residue of e to the st times the function. So that's just going to be e to the st over s plus a. The, po the fixed point sk, the pole, is going to be minus a. So we're going to plug this into this equation. So that's going to be 1 over 1 minus 1 factorial. So that's just going to be 0 factorial, that's 1. So this is just 1. The limit as s goes to minus a. And now for the derivative, we're going to have d to the power of n minus 1. n in this case is 1, so 1 minus 1 is 0. And we know that the 0 derivative of a function is just the function itself. So this basically disappears and becomes 1. And this is going to be multiplied by e to the st, s plus a, as we have here. And now we're going to have this expression, so that's s minus minus a, so that becomes a positive a. All of that to the power of n, so just to the power of 1 in this case. And the neat thing about it is that this and that cancel out, so we're left with the following. So the residue is going to be equal to the limit as s goes to minus a of e to the st. And that's going to become e to the minus a t. And that is a residue for that pole. Now the inverse Laplace transform of this function is going to be the sum of the residues and as we saw we only have one residue in this case so the inverse Laplace transform is just going to be e to the minus a t. So this is going to be our function of time. And if you remember the previous video we saw that if we take the Laplace transform of a function of the type e to the a t we get the function 1 over s minus a so if we make a negative, then it makes sense that the inverse Laplace transform is going to become e to the minus a t. And same if we apply, apply the Laplace transform to this, we would get back to this function. And that's uh, the nice thing about it. We can just keep going back and forth and things don't really change no matter how many times you do it. So that's the general idea behind it. Now, I'm just going to show you what would happen with a more complicated function just to illustrate what this is, but you won't be needing it much because there are plenty of tables and results on the inverse Laplace transform that you can find online. And I've actually posted a link in the description that contains uh, a summary of Laplace transform pairs that you can consult and it's gonna make things a lot easier for you so you don't have to apply the residue theorem over and over again and do all this tedious process to find the inverse Laplace transform. So just to show you another example, let's do the function s plus a squared 
S plus P. So how many poles do we have? We have two poles. The first one is order two, and it occurs at the value S equals to, so let's call this S1, S equals to minus A. And the second pole occurs is of order one, and it occurs at the point S2 equals minus P. So now we're gonna have two residues. So the first one is going to be the residue of the function e to the st times fs, so e to the st over s plus a squared s plus b, and that's going to be calculated at minus a, so that is the value of the pole. So this is going to be 1 over 2 minus 1 factorial. The limit as s goes to minus a of the derivative of n minus, so n in this case is 2, so that's 2 minus 1, so that will become the first derivative of this function. So I'm just going to call it gs here because that makes it easier. And s minus minus a, so that becomes plus a. And once again, that's squared, so that is going to become that. And then we would just proceed to actually simplify this expression, take the derivative, and then multiply by the constant, and we find that residue. The second residue, corresponding to the second pole, is going to be written as e to the st, s plus a squared, s plus b, and it is going to occur at the point s, uh, sk equals to minus b. So this is going to become, this is order 1, so that's going to be 1 over 0 factorial, so that's just 1, of the limit as s goes to minus b. And 1 minus 1 is 0, so the derivative disappears. So now we're going to have a simplified function, e to the st of s plus a squared s plus b. And that's going to be multiplied by s minus minus b, so that's s plus b to the power of 1 because that's the order of the pole. And then these two cancel out. And now we can just simply apply the limit. So as s goes to minus b, so we replace s by minus b here. So this would be e to the minus bt over a minus b squared. So that would be the value of this second residue. And once you have calculated both of them, your inverse Laplace transform of the whole function f of s is simply going to be the sum of those two residues. So it's just going to be 1 plus 2 once you have found what the first one is by applying all those steps. And so that's the general idea behind it. Basically, you just have to make use of this very, um, very complicated formula here. But hopefully this has revealed some of the properties and some of the things that you need to do in order to find the inverse Laplace transform of a function of frequency. And in the next video, we're actually going to apply all of this to solving uh, ordinary differential equations.